Welcome to Speak Life. Today I'd like to talk to you on the subject of hope. But first I think it's very important for you to understand that hope has two entirely different meanings. Now the first type of hope is a secular type of hope, meaning that we desire or we want something. For example, we hope that we get the job. Well, this is the type of hope that basically crosses its fingers and wishes for things to happen. Well, this type of hope is really quite different than the type of hope that the Bible describes. You see, because the Bible's use of the word hope conveys an entirely different type of a meaning. Now, the definition of hope, according to the Bible, is to desire something with confident expectation of its fulfillment. So this clearly shows us that it's one thing to simply cross our fingers and hope that something happens and something very different to confidently expect something to happen. So today I want to take a look at two different perspectives of hope and what these different perspectives resulted in. Now the first perspective I want to look at today is found in Matthew chapter 8 starting in verse 28. In this story, we find Jesus asleep along with his disciples when suddenly a tremendous storm comes upon the lake. Well, even though the boat is rocking and the waves are, are hitting the boat, somehow, some way, Jesus manages to continue sleeping in the boat. Well, that is until the disciples begin to panic. And so they wake Jesus saying, Lord, save us. We are going to drown. We are going to drown. You see, the problem in this story is that the disciples were putting their hope in what they were seeing in the natural. Because in the natural, they knew that a bad storm could do tremendous damage to their boat. And in the natural, they knew that their boat could only withstand so much abuse. And because of this, the disciples were choosing to look at their circumstances, and so they were expecting to drown. And they asked Jesus, don't you care that we will drown? Well, when Jesus replied back to them, his reply implicated, what's your problem? <laughs> what, what are you expecting to happen here? Don't you have any faith? Where's your trust? Just exactly what are you expecting to happen? Well, this story is a perfect reminder that in order for us to remain in hope, even during the worst storms of our lives, that we must maintain our trust in God despite what our circumstances look like. Well, many of you that are watching today, you're really going through some of the toughest storms of your entire life. And instead of placing your hope fully in God, some of you have been putting your hope in your doctor. Others of you have been putting your hope in your money. And some of you have been placing your hope in your own ability to bring you through what you are currently facing but you're just crossing your fingers and, and hoping things will improve. But you are still struggling with an underlying uncertainty that is really, really troubling your soul. Others of you that are watching today just feel like you have no hope at all. In fact, you are feeling completely and utterly hopeless. Well, the Bible cautions us in as what exactly hopelessness can do, as to exactly what this can result in. Now, in Proverbs chapter 13 and 12, the Bible tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. You see, when you have no hope at all, it will make your heart sick. That word deferred in the Greek means to put off. When you put off having any hope, your heart's going to become unhealthy. And when your heart becomes unhealthy, you're going to begin to view life from a stance of being very negative and, and very pessimistic. And because of this outlook, you no longer even look forward to the next day because you become so very negative that it's beginning to affect every single solitary detail and aspect of your life. Now, the enemy, Satan, he understands how powerful hope can be. The Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, according to John 10, 10. So the enemy knows that if he can just rob you of your hope, that he can set you on a path that is full of despair, full of depression, and full of destruction. So he will place thoughts in your mind like, oh, my situation is, is never going to change. My health is never going to improve. No, nothing's ever going to get better in my life. 
Now, if you will notice, each of these statements have one thing in common, and that is self-pity. Well, I want you to know that self-pity is nothing but a destructive, negative emotion that never accomplishes anything positive, but it only blinds us to our blessings, really. It robs us of, of our blessings, and it robs us of the possibility of anything good ever happening in our lives. So the loss of hope is really, really a destructive thing, and it only results in our simply existing we simply exist with, with no goals, with no vision, with no ambition in life. And this is not the way that God intended for us to live. You see, God wants us to be living with purpose. God wants us to be working toward goals with an exciting anticipation of incredible things happening in our life. Psalms 42 and 11 says, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. So I ask you watching today, why are you so discouraged? Why is your hope, excuse me, why is your heart so sad? Put your hope in God. You know, even though the Bible encourages us to put our hope in God, having hope for some of us just does not come naturally. So I believe that in order for us to live a life that is full of hope, that it's very, very important for us to really get to know the object of our hope. And the object of our hope, according to the Apostle Paul, is what Paul referred to as being the God of hope. You see, because knowing the God of hope can dramatically change your perspective of your circumstances. Because once you begin to really get to know God, you're going to begin to understand more and more that you can trust God. And because you can trust God, you can begin to expect God to do awesome things in your life. Well, right now, I'd like to take a look at, a, at an example of hope from a man who had a completely different perspective than the disciples did that day in the boat. And that is a man by the name of Abraham. Now, in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse 5, the Lord speaks to Abraham, and he tells Abraham that he is going to be the father of many nations. Well, the only problem there was that Abraham was almost 100 years old when the Lord gave him this promise, and his wife Sarah, too, was very old. So in the natural, becoming a father at almost 100 years old looked impossible. But the Bible tells us just exactly what Abraham decided to do. In Romans 4 and 18, the Bible says that against all hope, in hope, Abraham believed. So even though it was absolutely impossible for Abraham to become a father at that point due to his circumstances. And because really in the natural, Abraham had no reason to believe that he could become a father, it looked virtually impossible. But the Bible says that Abraham made the decision to have hope. And in fact, the Bible says that Abraham did not even consider his age, nor did he consider the fact that his wife, Sarah, was almost 100 years old as well, and, and that her womb was dead. You see, the only thing that Abraham took into consideration here was the promise that God gave him. That's the only thing that he considered. And because Abraham knew nothing was impossible with God, he made the decision to trust God because Abraham knew that God was faithful. Abraham knew that God was powerful. And Abraham knew that God had the ability to do what he said he was going to do. In fact, the Bible says that Abraham was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he said he was going to do. Well, I'd like you to keep in mind that one of the very best ways that you can get to know God is, is not only through spending quality time through prayer and through worship, but also through spending quality time reading God's Word, reading the Bible. 
You know, once you really begin to get into God's word, you're going to begin to read about the attributes of God. And as you begin to gain a better understanding of who God is, you're going to begin realizing that not only can God be trusted, but that God is more than able to assist you. God is more than able to help you. God is more than able to provide the answer that you need in the situation that you're currently facing. So reading God's word is very, 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 very important. You see, because when you begin to read about a God who had the supernatural ability to be able to part the Red Sea, when you begin to read about a God that had the supernatural ability to be able to feed the Israelites one day at a time with manna, when you begin to read about a God that has the power to create a universe, that had the power to raise his own son back from the dead, it's at that point in time that you begin to realize that not only is God limitless, but there is absolutely nothing too hard or too difficult for God to do. The Bible says there's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing too difficult for God to do. So no matter what circumstances that you may be facing today, when you know God, you know that you can expect God to do miraculous things in your life. Well, maybe you're watching today and you've recently lost your job and your finances have been very, very, very tight and you're just not quite sure how much longer that you're going to be able to make ends meet. Maybe you're watching today and you're struggling with an issue in your family. Maybe you're having some family uh, problems right now or maybe your health is deteriorating and you've really been given a, a bad diagnosis. Maybe your struggle has been causing you to, to focus on your circumstances and because you're focusing on your circumstances, you're beginning to lose all hope. Maybe you've been considering that negative doctor's report. Maybe you've been considering the way those children have been acting. Maybe you've been considering that situation that looks impossible. And because of that, you are choosing uh, to trust in what you're seeing in the natural and you have absolutely no expectation, no expectation at all of things ever getting any better. Well, maybe all that you need to do in order for your circumstances to change, maybe all that you need to do in order to come through that situation victoriously is to change your perspective. Perhaps you just need to begin looking at your situation from the same perspective that Abraham had, who, who was confident. He confidently expected God to come through for, for him. He was confident that God was going to come through. You know, once you begin to change your perspective, everything's going to change. You see, when you change your perspective, you're going to begin expecting. You're going to begin saying, I expect things to change. You're going to begin to say, I expect that mortgage to be paid. I expect those children to turn back to the Lord. I expect to win that court case. I expect what looks impossible to become possible. And the reason that I am expecting is because I know that there's nothing too hard for God. And I know the God of hope. So no matter how hard things are, no matter what you're facing, I want you to remember that God is with you. No matter how hot that that fiery trial may be that you are currently in, God has the ability to bring you out and to bring you through. You know, one of my very favorite stories in the Bible is the story about a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar and three Hebrew men by the names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, in this story, King Nebuchadnezzar makes the decision to build a 90-foot golden image and then he makes the announcement in Babylon that it's mandatory for everyone to bow before this golden image. Well, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego find out about this, they refuse to bow before this image. So they are brought before the king, 
And the king cautions them that if they continue to refuse not to bow before this image, that they are going to be immediately thrown into a fiery furnace to face certain death. Then the king said to the three men, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Well, the three Hebrew men stood their ground. They stood their ground and they said, hey, even if we're thrown into that fiery furnace, we want you to know that the God that we worship and the God that we serve will save and rescue us. But listen, even if he doesn't, we are not going to bow before that golden image. Well, this made King Nebuchadnezzar absolutely furious. So much so that he ordered that furnace to be turned up seven times hotter than usual and the men were immediately thrown into the furnace to face certain death. But after the men were thrown into the fire, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he took a look into the fire and he said, wait, 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 wait. Didn't I order three men to be thrown into the fire? He said, because I see four men walking around and they are untied and, and they are un unharmed. They're not harmed at all. And, and the fourth man, it, he looks like that of the son of God. Well, immediately the king said, bring these men out. And the Bible says that when the three men came out of the fire, not one hair on their head had been singed by the fire. Not only that, their clothes were perfectly intact and they did not even have the smell of smoke upon them. You see, these men knew their God. They knew that they could trust in the God of hope. Amen. Amen. Now, as believers, you and I too can rest in the assurance that God is working for our good. The Bible tells us in Romans 8 and 28 that all things work together for good for those that love God and for those that are called according to his purpose. You see, God causes all things to work together for good for those that love him. So be encouraged that in spite of what your circumstances may look like, that God can not only bring you out of that fiery trial, but that you can come out not even smelling like smoke. Today is your day to begin expecting again. Today is your day to begin hoping again. Today is your day for your joy to come back. Some of you watching today have not had any joy at all, but having hope is going to bring you joy this is exactly why the Bible tells us that the expectation of the righteous is joy. You see, when you begin to expect God to do things in your life, when you begin to expect God to change your situation and circumstances, it's going to bring you joy. And all of that depression and, and all of that dread and all of that hopelessness will begin to leave your life. And the reality is, is that if you're a Christian, you can begin expecting and because of that, you're not just sitting around with your fingers crossed wishing that things were going to improve in your life. You're expecting things to change. You're expecting your body to be healed. You're expecting to be able to pay that mortgage. You're expecting that rebellious child to begin coming back to the Lord and serving the Lord again. You are expecting that situation that looks impossible to become possible because you know the God of expectation. Amen. You are expecting. Maybe you're watching and and you're thinking right now, you know, I, I've tried hoping. I, I've tried all that hope business, and it just didn't work for me. You see, I hoped and I hoped and I hoped for a situation for quite some time, and nothing ever changed in my life. So I just threw in the towel. I, I gave up. I want to encourage you today, if that's you, to pick up that anchor of hope and to begin, once again, to expect God to do something in that situation. Oh, it may take longer than you thought it was going to take until you see the answer manifest in the natural. It might take longer than you thought that you were, it was going to take. But I want you to know 
that God is never late and that God is always, always right on time. I want you to know that God cares about you and that God cares about that situation that you're going through and that God is watching over that situation that you're currently facing and that if you will just continue to maintain your hope in the God of hope, that God will bring the answer that you're going to need, that God will make something beautiful out of that situation, that God will bring the promise that he gave you if you will just continue to hold on to the anchor of hope. Amen. Romans 8 and 25. If we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. If we hope for what we do not have as of yet, we continue to wait for it patiently. So as you're waiting, keep in mind that even though God made Abraham a promise, that promise didn't come into fruition until 25 years later. But Abraham waited and he waited and he waited and he waited. And finally, 25 years later, the Bible says that after he waited patiently, Isaac was born. 25 years later, he became a father. Never forget that the Bible says that Abraham was fully persuaded that God could do what he told him that he was going to do. See, Abraham was fully confident. He was fully assured that what God promised him was going to happen in his life. And why? Because Abraham knew God. So I ask you watching today, what are you expecting to happen in your circumstances? What are you expecting? Are you putting your hope in a limitless God or are you placing your hope in your limited circumstances? Are you like the disciples expecting to drown, expecting to be shipwrecked? Or are you like Abraham, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego expecting the God of hope to show up and to show off and to do what no other God can do. What are you expecting? You know, each and every one of our situations and circumstances, they may be just a little bit different, but there is one thing that each and every one of us have in common. And that is that each one of us has the opportunity to have hope. So I'd like to leave you with this today. Against all hope, in hope, choose hope. Well, maybe you're watching today and you've never gotten to know the God of hope. Maybe you've never had a relationship with him. You, you don't know anything about him. You, you just, you really don't know where to begin. Maybe you have allowed fear to, to hinder you from entering into a relationship with the God of hope. Maybe you've allowed guilt to keep you from entering in. Maybe you feel like you've done too many wrong things in your life and that God just wouldn't want to have a relationship with you. Maybe you have no idea what you need to do in order to begin to have a relationship with Him. Well, the Bible tells us that there is only one way to have a relationship with God the Father, and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. You see, Jesus Christ, He is the door that leads to life. He is the door that leads to not only living an abundant life, but He is the door that leads to forgiveness for all of the mistakes that you've made in your life, for all the sins that you've committed according to God's standard. You see, every one of us has fallen short. Not one of us can keep God's standard that is found in His Word. And so that's why we need to be forgiven. Jesus Christ is the only one that can offer that forgiveness. So I would like for you to pray with me right now. 
and invite Jesus to come into your life, I'd like to give you that opportunity. Won't you pray with me right now? Don't allow fear or guilt or any negative thoughts to enter your mind. Let's just pay, pray together right now. Jesus, I ask for the forgiveness of all of my sins. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your forgiveness. And right now, I ask that you would come into my life, that you would come into my heart, and that you would lead me and guide me in the way, in the truth, and in the life. Amen. Thank you for praying that prayer with me. I'm so excited that you prayed with me. And I hope that you'll contact me at the number on your screen because I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear the fact that you just made Jesus your Savior and the Lord of your life. And that now you're going to begin a brand new journey. He's going to walk beside you. He is going to walk with you through every circumstance, through every situation. He will lead you. He will guide you. And I'm know that right now you are experiencing a peace that you have never had before, a peace that surpasses all understanding. So I hope to hear from you, and I also hope that you'll check out my website. It can be found at shannonlittleministries.org. Thank you for joining me on Speak Life today. I pray that you have a tremendously blessed day and remember to always speak life. I want to hear about everything the Lord is doing in your life or just to be able to have the opportunity to pray with you. You see, when God was speaking this to Abraham, he wasn't speaking it just for the benefit of Abraham, but God was speaking this to Abraham for the benefit of God's people. God tells us in his word, he said, I will give you every place that you set your foot, but you've got to set your foot into that new place. But you're going to have to face every giant that is standing in your way of facing success. And that's what some of you need to do. You need to cut off the heads of some of the things that are trying to hinder you from moving into your future. You need to cut off the head of fear. You need to cut off the head of doubt. You need to cut off the head of unbelief and face everything, every giant that's standing in your way of moving into that new door, the door of opportunity that is wide and ready for you to open. He promises us that He is the way he is the truth and He is the life. And there is only one way to the Father, and that's through the Son, Jesus Christ.